Well, Shalomi, my favorite homies in all the world. How are you doing today? I hope you're living courageously. For those of you that haven't gotten an opportunity, I hope you take a cold shower, invigorate your soul, do something courageous like that. Otherwise, let's just get on with it, shall we? We're back for another episode of the War of the Ages. Yes. Let's get right into it. I spent a few hours trying to record this video already, and then it was gone, utterly destroyed. Damn it. I was not happy, but you know what? We're back for more. Let's go for it again. Let's try round two, shall we? Check this out. We're going to talk about celestial battles. Yes, crazy battles. Maybe it was because I was talking about Norfolk Naval Base, super highly defended territories. We're just, just talking about combat. You know, it's just, it's a crazy world out there. Crazy world out there. And the enemy's like places that he targets most viscerally. But I'm just going to jump in with a story that's in a totally different arena, shall we? Because I read a story to my girls recently about Deborah, a lady who ends up assassinating a king's general. <laughs> Sweet Jael. <laughs> it's a great story. Guys, the Bible's rich with all kinds of incredible, terrifying stories of sweet revenge. I love those stories. Hallelujah. They give me hope for a day of deliverance. You know what I mean? <sighs> Let's get on to a story. Okay, but actually, before we get in there, we're going to enter in. Well, we'll just get there. We're going to go to Judges chapter 4. Come with me for a journey, okay? We're going to end up in the uh, crazy places where the dragon and his battle and warring angel and mortals fight with Mikael. You know, we'll see where it ends up. Because Dr. Michael Lake has a chapter in here on spiritual warfare and the weapons of our warfare in his Sharith Imperative, Empowering the Remnant to Overcome the Gates of Hell, one of my favorite books. He's got a section in there about the armor, which is just valuable, and hopefully we'll hit that. But let's jump in. I'm going to be reading from the ISR Scriptures translations. I know you guys ask a lot. That's where I'm reading from today. Let's dive in, shall we? Chapter 4. When Ehud was dead. Oh, Ehud, one of my favorite assassins ever. Yes, covert strike teams, left-handed. A guy who's got a disability in his right hand. Builds a dagger. Hallelujah for the knife makers out there. Builds a dagger. Assassinates a king. Beautiful story. Loses his knife, his dagger, inside the body of this fat giant king fantastically brutal story. And then he delivers the people through the armies. It's amazing. Anyways, that guy dies. In the time of the judges, this is a crazy season in the history of Israel. Okay, I'm going to jump in just a little bit, and then we're going to go back to the establishment of the judges, to like where we get their the, the, the actual origin story of the judges. Because if you don't know where we are in the scriptures, in the timeline story of things, it doesn't really make sense when we get into some of these stories. And it's really like, eh, Whatever. For those of you that are very familiar with the judges and the seasons of who were the rulers before the kings and prophets and all this stuff, be patient with those that aren't. Let's bear up each other's burden, shall we? Judges chapter 4. And when Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the eyes of Yahuwah. Therefore, Yahuwah sold him into the hand of Yabin, the sovereign of Canaan, who reigned in Hatzor. And the commander of his army was Sisera. Ooh, Sisera. Who was dwelling in Hasareth. Hagoaim. And the children of Israel cried out to Yahuwah because he had 900 chariots of iron. Okay, this is like nuclear class submarines. Bad news stuff. You know what I'm saying? He's like, they can rain fire out of the sky from anywhere and then disappear without us knowing it. This is bad. This is really scary. Apparently, these iron chariots were a formidable force that the Israelites were unfortunately riddled with fear. That gummit. You think Yahuwah couldn't have dealt with the Iron chariots, he had dealt with the Nephilim and the Amalekites. Like, he dealt with giants for them and blotted them out of the land. Unfortunately, the people were naughty and they entered into those covenants with the people that they were supposed to drive out and they married their daughters and they're all like, yeah, you know, maybe we'll just hang out with their teraphim. They're shrunken heads of their slaughtered innocent firstborns that they turn into idols that talk. Crazy episode, guys. Go listen to my episode on shrunken heads and talking idols, real life talking idols that talk to them. It said, by the power of the stars. These idols talk to them. So we're going to get into the stars fighting from heaven. Good stars, good immortals, and bad immortals. Clearly, something to consider. And the children of Israel cried out to Yahuwah because he had 900 chariots of iron. And for 20 years, he harshly oppressed the children of Israel. He's like the World Economic Forum mixed with the Club of Rome and all of the papacy, all combined into one terrible nightmare, just bringing forth Agenda 2030 from the United Nations. They're like the enforcing blue helmets of nightmares upon the people. Sucks. Brutal time to be alive. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was ruling Israel at that time. 
and she was dwelling under the palm tree of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for a right ruling. And she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinuam, from Kadesh in Naphtali. And she said to him, Has not Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel, commanded? Go, and you shall draw towards Mount Tabor, and shall take with you ten thousand men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun. And I shall draw unto you Sisera, the commander of Yabin's army, with his chariots and his company at the Wadi Kishon, and shall give him into your hand. And Barak said to her, If you go with me, then I shall go. But if you do not go with me, I do not go. And she said, I shall certainly go with you. Only there shall be no esteem for you in the journey, for you are taking. For Yahuwah is going to sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. So Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak, by the way, every time you're hearing Barak, this is the Hebrew word for lightning, like lightning every time. It's like just something to consider. Previous president, Barack Hussein Obama, lightning. Mm-hmm. He was enthroned on the throne of Pergamum, literally the Democratic National Convention in Denver, Colorado. He sat under a great white horse and they rebuilt the architecture of the style of the throne from Pergamum, which is literally in the scriptures and revelation, the throne that Zeus was at. And it literally said that's where Satan dwelled. So like Satan, you know, the dragon, he lived on that throne. He has literal places he lives and sits on, and people commune with him because he's the prince of the power of the air. He's like the king of the earth in a totally different way than what most people are considering. And you can, people literally sit down and have conversations with the dragon. Well, and then there's other people who are like deep occultists who then take those things and then bring them forth to modernity. And that's literally where Barack Hussein Obama was like enshrined to be the presidential candidate. That's where the lightning came. Something to consider, you guys. The world is full of crazy, wonderful, weird places. And he went up 10,000 men under his command, and Deborah went with him. And Heber, the Canite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moshe, had separated himself from the Canites and pitched his tent near the terebinth tree at Zanaim, which is beside Kadesh. And they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So check this out. For those of you that don't have too much context on the story here, li listen, Moshe's father-in-law is a guy named Jethro. We're going to go back to Exodus 18 here in just a second. But these people were part of the Canaanites, all right? But they separated it themselves from physically the people that were in the land who were idolaters, right? The people that are sacrificing their babies to Moloch, and they're just worshiping the star of Rempham and all the other garbage that's happening all the time out there. They physically move themselves away from them, and they are practitioners of the Torah, like they're followers of the ways of Yahuwah. And we're going to learn that even Midian, in the land of Midian, there was people that were practicing the ways of righteousness who were keeping the commands of Yahuwah, even though they weren't a part of the direct Exodus community at the time. Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, is one of those people. He's literally a priest of Yahuwah, even though he's not a direct lineage descendant of them. It's amazing, guys. The commandments that were given back to Adam had been preserved and guarded by people ever since then. And not all of them were just seed line descendants of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. There was others that were at different places in the world that were preserving and guarding the ways of Yahuwah. And Jethro is one of those people. Let's go back here to uh, jump in here. Exodus 18. What's a beautiful thing, though, is that you see him guarding his family from the influences of the world, and they separated themselves from that system. And that's, you know, one of the paramount ways that my family and I have tried to live our life is that, yes, we live in and around the people of the world, but we do our best to raise our family outside of it. Like Abraham could have lived in Sodom and Gomorrah like Lot did. They could have moved into Sodom. Lot chose to cash out of the agrarian lifestyle and all the incredible riches and bounty that he had under Abraham. And he decided to move into, into Sodom. Okay. He couldn't maintain that same lifestyle by doing that, but he cashed in and he ended up going into the city. Well, unfortunately you see that the folly of the city wore off on his family in a lot of ways. His children were very, very wayward. They're like, go get your family members and your wives and husbands, like bring them all back here to our house. And she's like, none of them showed up. They mocked him. They thought he was joking. They're like, they made fun of him. He's like, uh, it says mockers are going to come in the last days. They're going to make fun of you. Listen, it's been going on a long time, you guys. There's like micro stories of revelation all the way back then too. But 
Unfortunately, he didn't separate himself from the ways of Sodom and it infected his family. That being said, you do see how Abraham guarded his family and gave him a separation between those two places so that they were able to learn the ways of righteousness without having to be in the direct worldly influence on a continual basis. And it provided them wisdom amidst those circumstances. So let's jump into Exodus 18. And Yithro, the priest of Midian, Moshe's father-in-law, heard of all that Elohim had done for Moshe and for all Yisrael and his people, that Yahuwah had brought Yisrael out of Mitzrayim. And Yithro, Moshe's father-in-law, took Zipporah, the wife of Moshe, after he had sent her back, and her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom. For he had said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eleazar. For he said, the Elohim of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Yithro, Moshe's father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moshe in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of Elohim. And he had said to Moshe, I, your father-in-law Yithro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. And Moshe went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other about their welfare. And they went into the tent. And Moshe told his father-in-law all that Yahuwah had done to Pharaoh and to the Mitzrites for Yisrael's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way, and how Yahuwah had delivered them. And Yithro rejoiced for all the good which Yahuwah had done for Yisrael, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Mitzrites. And Yithro said, Blessed be Yahuwah, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Mitzrites and out of the hand of Pharaoh and who has delivered the people from the under the hand of the Mitzrites. Now I know that Yahuwah is greater than all the mighty ones, indeed in the matter in which they acted proudly above them. This is a beautiful declaration. Yethro is literally talking about how the preeminency of Yahuwah El Shaddai is supreme to all other immortals. He identifies that the true fruit of his power was in what happened, in, says in Exodus 12 to all. Listen to this. One of the most important verses about understanding the time of the Exodus happens in chapter 12 when the command about Passover is given, the warning about what's going to happen with the destroying angel that's going to come unless the blood of the lamb is on the doorpost. Listen. And this is verse 12. And I shall pass through the land of Mitzrayim on that night and shall strike all the firstborn in the land of Mitzrayim, both man and beast, and on all the mighty ones, immortals, of Mitzrayim, I shall execute judgment. I am Yahuwah. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I shall pass over you and let the plague not come on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Mitzrayim. That is the real heart of what happened with the plagues of Exodus. The real judgment was upon the mighty ones, the immortals that reigned over Mitzrayim. It was the power source that gave Mitzrayim the ability to govern, to rule as an empire, as a nation state. It was really the heart of where they divined their power from. That's what Yahuwah had to deal with before the people could be let out. Listen, Moses had the desire for vengeance, the desire for retribution. He understood that Yahuwah had preserved his life from the earliest years and that he was to be a deliverer to the people all the way from the very beginning of his life. And yet when he tried to do that of his own power, when he tried to physically fight back and kill one of the oppressors, that was doing horrific things. It wasn't just that he was oppressing the Hebrew man, right? It says in the book of Jasher that the man who was oppressing the Hebrew man had broke, they were breaking into the house of the men, of, they were breaking into the homes of the Hebrew men and they were raping their wives. And then they were going out and oppressing the men. That's the kind of horrible evil of what was happening with the taskmasters, the slave drivers of the Hebrews. They were doing egregiously horrible stuff, right? Way worse than, than what you get if you just kind of have that cursory glance at the scriptures. Horrible stuff, right? They were making fathers entomb their children into the walls of the buildings and, and brick them in, right? This is inurement stuff that still happens today down in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Like I witness people that still engage in this stuff because this spirit 
spirit of Egypt is here in the Americas. This is this is the land of Mitzrayim, you guys. This is the land of bondage in so many ways. The land where they still exercise a tax on the dead. If your family member dies, they're still going to tax you on their death. That's like something that doesn't happen. It was like the epitome of what made Egypt Egypt. They started taxing people for the dead. You know, this is the originations of where the Pharaoh came from. Anyways, Yahuwah was dealing with the power bank behind the scenes in order for them to be able to, to come to freedom. Yahuwah had to judge out against the mighty ones. Moses tried to enact a judgment to think the people are going to rise up and follow me after this. But instead, Yahuwah had not dealt justice, Mishvat, against the immortals. And until that was done, there was no way the people were going to get let out of there. And so this is why Jethro and other nations from all over the world understood, okay, Yahuwah, yod heh vav the, the, the mighty one of the Hebrews is not to be trifled with. He just destroyed the ten mighty ones over Mitzrayim, right? We, finalizing it with Ra and the sun god and all this. I mean, he triumphed over them in victory. It was a huge deal. Even the final showdown that's right before Jethro gets to this place where he meets Moses happened outside of a place called Baal Zaphon, the mountain of Baal, right? This is one of their temples, one of his high temples. This is literally where the Red Sea crossing takes place is right at the footsteps of Baal Zaphon. This is like where they camped and Pharaoh came with his army to try to kill them all. And then the angel of Yahuwah came as a wall of fire between them all that night. I mean, it's, a, it's the showdowns that are taking place are are literally at the gates of hell. They're at the gates of the enemy where these events take place. And it gives context to these story uh, that we just lack unless we have a lens through which to see this war of the ages is always taking place at major monumental moments. For those of you that are going through horrific trials in your life, understand the enemy is trying to resist breakthrough. The enemy's goal and agenda is always to drive us away from deliverance, from a promotion to the next step. He sets up as much as he can landmines in your life to detonate at predetermined times to keep you from the path of life, to keep you from the narrow way, to keep you from the things that will deliver you. Like I challenged you guys last time, read through a chapter of the Proverbs every day for the day of the month that it is. There's 31 chapters in there. Read through that whatever day. If you're on the 22nd day of, of the month, Read that proverb for that day. Just start with the foundational basis of seeking wisdom every single day. It's imperative for us to have this regard because that's the place where we can build so much of the strong foundations of our life to break through when it is that time and that season of massive onslaught, attacks from all angles and every side. But because of that perseverance, the nations all over the world now know Yahuwah is not to be messed with. You know, similar things that take place during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Where there's these showdowns between immortals, like with Elijah, and we talked about it at Mount, uh, the mountain, you know, at the top of the mountain. Oh man, Mount Carmel. These showdowns are between immortals as much as they have their human assets on the earth. But check this out. This is one of the most principled things for leadership and business orientation for those of you guys that are in those positions. Please pay attention here. Then Yithro, the father-in-law of Moshe, brought an ascending offering and other slaughterings unto Elohim. And Aharon came with all the elders of Yisrael to eat bread with the father-in-law of Moshe before Elohim. And it came to be on the next day that Moshe sat to rightly rule the people. And the people stood before Moshe from morning until evening. And when the father-in-law of Moshe saw that all the people he did, and when the father-in-law of Moshe saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you sit by yourself and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moshe said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to seek Elohim. When they have a matter, they come to me, and I rightly rule between one and another and make known the laws of Elohim and his Torah. And the father-in-law Moshe said to him, What you are doing is not good. Both you and these people with you shall certainly wear yourselves out. For the matter is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it by yourself. Now listen to my voice. Let me counsel you, and Elohim be with you. Stand before Elohim for the people, and you shall bring the matters to Elohim. And you shall enlighten them concerning the laws in the Torah, and show them the way in which they should walk, and the work which they do. But you yourself seek out from all the people able men who fear Elohim. 
men of truth, aiding unfair gain, and place these over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and they shall rightly rule the people at all times. And it shall be that they bring every great matter to you, but they themselves rightly rule every small matter. So make it lighter for yourself, for they shall bear with you. If you do this word, and Elohim shall command you, then you shall be able to stand, and all this people also go to their place in peace. And Moshe listened to the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he said. This is a principle that ministries in particular, and business leaders, can institute into their lives to follow the path of wisdom. Listen, Moses received the rebuke of an elder. It was an incredible, it's a moment of meekness and humility to do that, right? But by taking that, like it says in the Proverbs, enemies multiply kisses, but the wounds from the of a, from a friend, like a proper rebuke, it brings life. It really does. Moses is going to receive the wisdom that's coming from an elder. And because of that, the people will prosper and he himself will find relief. And Moshe chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And they rightly ruled the people at all times. The hard matters they brought to Moshe, but they rightly ruled every small matter themselves. And Moshe sent off his father-in-law, and he went away to his own land. This is where so much of the origin story of the judges are, the right rulers the people that were the governors of the territories of the people. After the times of Joshua and the conquest and the invasion of Canaan, they were the ones who were in charge of handling matters and disputes that came up. And if anything got kind of beyond their scope or beyond their pale, they were supposed to have a supreme ruler. They had one ruler that was kind of over them, a judge that was over all the people. Right now in the story, that's Deborah. That is, she's the one who's rightly ruling for the people in these smaller, these great matters, right? That brings us back into our story. You ready? And that they reported to Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. Now, listen, it's the family of Moshe's father-in-law, of Yethro, that are the ones that are actually reporting to Sisera. They're like, hey, just so you know, your enemy is filling up an army. But remember, this is what Deborah prophesied was going to happen. He's like, I'm going to bring Sisera down here. And he's using this family to be able to do so. This is important later on in the story. So Sisera called all his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him from Harasheth, Hagoyim, to the Wadi Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Rise up, for this is the day in which Yahuwah has given Sisera into your hand. Has not Yahuwah gone out before you? And Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men after him. And Yahuwah destroyed Sisera and all his chariots, and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera leapt from his chariot and fled away on foot. Now in the next chapter, we're going to learn how he did that. And it literally says, from the Shemaim, from the heavens, the stars fought against Sisera. And they literally opened up and poured out deluges upon his head in order to ruin the mobility on one side of those chariots of iron. Yeah, you can't fight in mud. Go ahead and ask everyone that's ever tried to invade Russia how badly it goes. The Russian winter and fall is a big deal. The spring, too. It's a nightmare trying to invade that place. Basically, everybody, bigger country that tries it, loses bad. This is why, like, the, the reason the Third Reich fell and, and coverted itself and came to America and established itself here and in Great Britain and is now we live under the Fourth Reich and the oppression of the Nazis. They never lost that comment. They just became the chameleons like the Jesuits they were and uh, took over us. You guys, welcome to the Catholic Intelligence Agency and the CIA. Anyways, they invaded Russia. That was it. Game over. As soon as they did that, big mistake. That's what happened in Napoleon too, you guys. Big deal. Trying to invade a country, even mechanized warfare or not, but in mud, this will ruin you. And this is fundamentally what happened here. But this is a crazy, awesome story. This is how Yahuwah defeated the army as he literally used his immortals to fight from the heavens to destroy a physical army on the earth. Awesome stuff. Should screaming bells to Joshua 10 and the sun standing still in Gibbon and hail fire coming out of the sky to crush the heads of the enemy. Cool stuff, you guys. Bible's awesome. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harosheth. Hagoyim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not one was left. Sisera, meanwhile, 
had fled on foot to the tent of Yael, the wife of Heber the Canaanite. For there was peace between Yabin, the sovereign of Hazor, and the, and the house of Heber the Canaanite. And Yael, Jael, went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my master, turn aside to me, do not fear. So he turned aside with her into the tent. She covered him with a blanket, and he said to her, Please, give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. So she opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, Stand by the door of the tent, and it shall be if anyone comes and asks you and says, Is there a man here? You say no. But Yael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into the side of his head. And it went down into the ground, for he was fast asleep and exhausted, and he died. And see, as Barak pursued Sisera, Yael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, see, let me show you the man whom you are seeking. And he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera, dead, with the peg in the side of his head. And on that day Elohim humbled Yabin, the sovereign of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Yabin, the sovereign of Canaan until they had cut off Yabim, the sovereign of Canaan. And on that day, Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang, saying, For leaders leading in Yisrael, for the people volunteering, bless Yahuwah. Hear, O sovereigns, give ear, O princes, I, I do sing to Yahuwah. I sing praise to Yahuwah Elohim of Yisrael. Yahuwah, when you went out from Sair, when you stepped from the field of Edom, the earth shook, and the heavens poured, the clouds also poured water. The mountains flowed at the presence of Yahuwah, this Sinai, at the presence of Yahuwah Elohim of Yisrael. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Yael, the highways were deserted, and the travelers went in crooked ways. Leadership ceased, and it ceased in Yisrael until I, Deborah, arose. A mother in Yisrael arose. They chose new mighty ones. Then fighting was in the gates. Neither a shield nor spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. Do you hear this? They went and chose new mighty ones. They went and chose new immortals. And because of that, they are afflicted. Because of that, they are turned to violence. They're turned to destruction. When people choose these immortals, man, do they get it ever? And the people of Yahuwah, if we choose these immortals, man, do we reap it. My heart is toward the inscribers of Yisrael, the volunteers among the people. Bless Yahuwah, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk along the way, declare it. By the voice of shouters, between the places of drawing water, they are recount the righteous acts of Yahuwah, the righteous acts of his leadership in Yisrael. Then the people of Yahuwah shall go down to the gates. Wake up, wake up, Deborah, wake up, wake up, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Abinoam. Then he sent the remnant to rule the nobles. Yahuwah came down for me against the mighty ones. You see this? This is tantamount parts of spiritual warfare. Like, Yahuwah arises to fight in these battles. Like, there's other places of time where they're like, Yahuwah, gird yourself. Take up your battle axe. Fight on our behalf. But we have this idea of Yahuwah as like a passive creator who like created us one. This is what's called like a deistic view. And this is what most theological seminaries basically have of Yahuwah. And they impress upon their pastors and then poison the populace with. That like, yeah, he was like present back then, but he's just like not anything anymore. They don't think about him as like actively fighting and, and waging wars against the immortals that are rebellious. But let me tell you, like the, the son of his right hand, right? The, the one who is in his presence, he fights for us on our behalf, right? He is the deliverer of us, the one who rebukes the dragon on our behalf and contends with these immortals. Like he has a son who is ferocious, El Gabor, the mighty one of mighty ones, the, the conqueror of nations who rules with a right hand in his rod of iron, man, mighty and triumphant. This is why when I read the scriptures, the supernatural view, the worldview that I have comes from these pages because I've also seen it play out in my life. 
I have seen people disappear from the presence of, of the people that were pursuing me and destroying me and seeking my life. I've seen them disappear. I've seen them disappear from afflicting me and tormenting me. The people that were giving me anguish for so many years of my life, I've seen Yahuwah deliver me from them in powerful and profound ways. And you know what? Because of that, I understand that this realm of the supernatural is undeniable. And when we walk in ways that are pleasing before him, he rises up and delivers us. Out of Ephraim, their root is against Amalek. After you, Benjamin, with your peoples, out of Machir, and scribes came down, out of Zebulun, those who handle the scribes read. The heads of Yissachar were with Deborah. And as Yissachar, so was Barak sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Why did you remain among the sheepfolds to hear the bleeding of the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. Gilead remained beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan sojourn by the ships? Asher continued at the seashore and remained by its landing places. Zebulun is a people who risked their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the field. Sovereigns came. They fought. Then the sovereigns of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils of silver. From the heavens they fought. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. This literally talks about the luminaries, right? These beings that are above our heads and they're luminaries. These beings fought on behalf of the people of Yahuwah, right? They are the ones who gave them into the hand of Barak. It was these immortals that gave them the victory. And this isn't the only time this happens. When we go back to Joshua 10, we have another account of this taking place. And you'll see the counterforce to this also when the dragon comes out to break, wage his war against those that guard the commandments of Yahuwah and keep the testimonies of Yeshua, when he brings down that counterforce of a third of the watcher, a third of the immortals, and come with him to wage his final collective war against mankind, that's he's bringing everything he's absolutely got, and he's going to try to open out of his mouth comes a great river that comes down. You'll see these deluges coming from the heavens. This is chapter 10. And it came to be when Adonai Zadek, the sovereign of Jerusalem, this is Jerusalem, heard that Yahshua had captured Ai and had put it under the ban that he had done to Ai and to its sovereign as he had done to Jericho and its sovereign, and that the inhabitants of Gibbon had made peace with Israel and were in their midst. They feared greatly, because Gibbon was a great city, as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty. Gibberim, literally a city of mighty men of valor. Gibberim. And Adonai Zadak, the sovereign of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, sovereign of Hebron, and to Pairam, the sovereign of Yarmuth, and to Yaphaya, the sovereign of Lachish, and to Debir, the sovereign of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me. Let us strike Gibbon, for it has made peace with Yahshua and with the children of Israel. So the five sovereigns of the Amorites, the sovereign of Jerusalem, the sovereign of Hebron, the sovereign of Yarmuth, the sovereign of Lachish, the sovereign of Eglon, gathered together and went up, they and all their armies, and camped before Gibbon and fought against it. And the men of Gibbon sent to Yahshua at the camp at Gilgal, saying, Do not withdraw your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the sovereigns of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have assembled against us. Now, for a little context here, the Gibeonites were people of the land that were set under the ban. They should have been blotted out to the man, to the animal. However, they came under deceitfulness against the Israelites. The Israelites, when they were coming in and they would lay siege to a city, understand they, they did this by surrounding it from three sides. Okay. They gave the people of the city an opportunity to basically, if you want to get out of here, you got to, we are about to exercise our right to take over this entire landscape. Okay. If you want to live here, you have to follow the ways of Yahuwah. If you don't, and you're going to die. If you want to stay here and practice your idolatry and sacrifice your babies and do all this other disgusting stuff, detestable, abominable things, we are going to put you to death. If you want to leave, you can go outside of our territory where this is not instituted. You can flee. And that's literally how they would siege a city. They would give people an opportunity to flee and to retreat out of it. If they didn't, they would be put to death, right? 
well, this is Gibeonites. They're like, mm, this isn't good. So they made themselves look as if they were from people of a different country. They dressed themselves in rags. They brought bread that was dry and crusty. Their living bread was now dying and despairing and full of mold. They brought wineskins that were worn out. Their sandals were ragged. They looked like they came from a long journey. And they deceived Joshua and his people from knowing the truth of where they were. And they entered into a covenant of peace with them. Joshua did not consult Yahuwah. And because of that, they entered into a covenant of protection for them. Well, then a few days later, they came to the area of the Gibeonites, and they're like, dang it. So they bound them to be servants to the Levites, to be the hewers of wood, like people that were collecting wood for them, sawing wood, stoking, stoking the fires, and drawers of water. They're like servants of servants. That was their job then from those days forward. This is supposedly also the tribe where Nathan, the prophet of David, came from the Gibeonites. He's one of the children of the Gibeonites. He's the one that escaped the butchering of King Saul when he ordered the slaughter of all the priests at Nob, Gibeonites were a part of them, right? They lived alongside the priests. And that, when he did that and he killed the priests, like, um, oh, what's his dad's name? I can't remember the name of the priest. I totally forgot it right now. But the guy who ran to David in the wilderness with the ephod, the guy who lost his family was blotted out. Nathan the prophet also escaped and all of his family was killed with the Gibeonites. That killing of all the Gibeonites in the days of, of King Saul's zealousness led to famine for years during the reign of King David later on. Okay, It was a big deal because they broke that covenant of peace and protection, and then there was blood that was required towards it. So in order to appease that, David had seven, I think it's seven of the sons of Saul were hung on a tree and butchered or killed for that, executed in order to right that wrong, right? Because they committed murder. They murdered like a, it's like killing a, a brother. And so it says where there's blood that's been spilled by a murderer, the murderer's blood shall be spilled in its place. And that's literally what took place. Anyways, so that's a backstory of the Gibeonites. Now they have this duty to protect them. They're like, dang it, we're in this covenant contract. We got to go protect them. So, But what's cool is you see how even here, Yahuwah honors the covenant of protection that's over the people from the heavens. So then Yahshua came upon oh this is so good and joshua went up from gilgal he and all the soldiers with him and all the mighty brave men Gibberim. and yahuwah said to joshua do not fear for i have given them into your hand not one of them does stand before you so then joshua came upon them suddenly having gone up all night from gilgal and yahuwah threw them into confusion before yisrael and they struck them with a great slaughter at gibbon and pursued them along the way that goes from Beth Horon, and struck them as far as Azekah and Makadah. And it came to be as they fled before Yisrael, and they were on the descent of Beth Horon, that Yahuwah threw down large hailstones from the heavens on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than those whom the sons of Yisrael had killed with the sword. Then Yahshua spoke to Yahuwah, in the day when Yahuwah gave the Amorites over to the children of Yisrael. Just pause for a second. Yahuwah rains down from the heavens part of his weapon system. Check this out, man. Yahuwah has in his arsenal, like an arsenal, the vault where he keeps his weapons, hailstones, just ragged chunks of ice that he's like, I'm going to just drop these on your skull. Devastating reign of power. You can't hide from it. I don't care how awesome your AH-64 Apache longbow is plethora of incredible technology nothing's going to survive the hailstorms dudes bad day coming rains it down on them fights from the heavens for them on their behalf not only it's going to get even sweeter check this out and he said before the eyes of yisrael sun stand still over gibbon and moon in the valley of elon so the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nations avenged itself upon their enemies is this not written in the book of Yashar? That's Jasher. Thus the sun stopped in the midst of the heavens and did not hasten to go down an entire day. There has been no day like it before it or after it that Yahuwah listened to the voice of a man because Yahuwah fought for Yisrael. Mm. He literally is like, hey, Yahuwah, please don't let the sun go down nor the moon. Have them stay right there so we can kill all of these people while we got the opportunity to do so. And Yahuwah hearkens to his voice and tells the sun, hey, sun, you stand still right there. You stop moving. Moon, hey, you moon, you stop moving too. And she's like, yes, Yahuwah, you got it. And the sun's like, you got it. Yes, Abba. 
Like that's incredible. See, we have other opportunities where the luminaries from the heavens obey the voice of Yahuwah. They're going to listen. This is why the sun stopped giving his light on the day when Yahuwah commanded it for three days and nights. Darkness was in all the land of it, of Mitzrayim, but not in the land of Yisrael for three days and three nights. That's him commanding his luminaries. You're going to shine or you're not going to shine, right? He's like, moon, you're going to stop moving. He's like, sun, you're going to stop moving. This is just the beauty of seeing how Yahuwah's creation responds to the voice of the creator. It always will. And this is literally part of the promises. Part of the covenants of protection that we have is that he literally, he puts his name upon it. He's like, if the sun will stop shining and rising every day, he's like, that's the when my word's not coming to pass. You know what I'm saying? He literally ties his words, fulfillment of prophecy to the sun and the moon's course in the luminaries. Like they are going to continue to do exactly what they're going to do until it's the absolute end of the age. This is part of like our blessed assurance that we have in his word being con con a continuity of truth and a source of life. Something to consider, you guys. That sun standing still. Just consider it. And it was reported. Now these so five sovereigns had fled and hidden themselves in a cave at Makadah. And it was reported to Joshua saying, The five sovereigns have been hidden in the cave at Makadah. have been found. And Joshua said, Roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. And you do not stand still, but pursue your enemies and smite them in the rear. Do not allow them to enter their cities. For Yahuwah your Elohim has given them into your hand. And it came to be when Joshua and the children of Israel ended striking them with a very great slaughter till they had finished. But those who escaped went into walled cities. Then all the people returned to the camp at, to Yahshua at Magadah in peace. No one moved his tongue against any one of the sons of Israel. Then Yahshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five sovereigns to me from the cave. And they did so and brought those five sovereigns to him from the cave the sovereign of Yerushalayim, the sovereign of Hebron, the sovereign of Yarmuth, the sovereign of Lekish, the sovereign of Eglon. And it came to be when they brought out those sovereigns to Yahshua, that Yahshua called for all the men of Yisrael and said to the chiefs of the men of the battle who went with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these sovereigns. And they drew near and put their feet on their necks. Then Yahshua said to them, Do not be afraid nor be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. For this is what Yahuwah is going to do to all your enemies whom you are fighting. And afterward, Yahshua struck them and killed them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging on the trees until evening. And it came to be at the time of the going down of the sun that Yahshua commanded. And they took them down from the trees and threw them into the caves where they had been hidden and laid large stones on against the cave's mouth to this day. Savage, man. Yahuwah has these incredible stories in here, these testimonies that we're supposed to guard and not forget. And as we do so, it bolsters our faith and understanding of how the Father provides protection, deliverance, and satisfaction of us from our enemies and will literally interject himself into the story when he needs to, to help us to fight on our behalf. I hope you guys never lose sight of the supernatural supremacy of our Creator. We really are engaged in a cosmic battle, a war of the ages. And it's not any different back then or today. Yahuwah still has the power and the authority to give us deliverance, to help us contend with these forces that are battling. Listen, some of them are beneath our feet. Some of them resides in dark chambers in these secret tunnel systems. That's, that's where some of them rule and reign from. Some of them operate here on the surface of the earth. And some of them literally operate above our heads in the heavenly realms. And listen... They all have power and influence to great degrees over the course of our lives. And the enemies, our enemies, the people that are using secret knowledge that was divine for them, given to them, preserved to them, they use that to overcome the ignorant masses. This is why there's strategies that take place. Like those five kings conspired together. They sat down, rulers of the earth, they sat down and conspired how they're going to go kill and execute judgment against these people. These types of conspiracy have been going on for a long time. But my question for you is, do you recognize that every time we see in the story physical agents gathering themselves to attack the people of Yahuwah, there's spiritual forces that are coming in behind the scenes that have to get dealt with every single time. And you see this delivering powerful hand that comes through here. We're going to jump into the Sharif imperative. I'm going to just grant you guys a little 
more insight into this book because it's really good. I want to get into his next book because I'm well into that one right now and I want to take you along, but I didn't want to miss for me what was one of my favorite points of what he brings forward. Check this out. Let's go back to where we were on his uh, the armor. Oh no, let's let's do just another one. Because the last time we left here, we are dealing with principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, the Perro Numenikai, the Cosmocrotters. That's the cosmic. My contention is we're dealing with a lot of Cosmocrotters in those previous stories about those immortals and the luminaries. Oh. Now he, let's jump into the spiritual wickedness. Oh no, we already did that one. Let's go to the spiritual wickedness. This is on page 315 from the Sharith Imperative. Spiritual wickedness. During my research, I have formed a different understanding of spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul uses the Greek word pneumatikos for spiritual in this verse. Pneumatikos can mean relating to the human spirit or rational soul as part of the man which is akin to God and serves as his instrument or organ, belonging to a spirit or a being higher than man but inferior to God, the spirit of God and pertaining to the wind or breath, windy, exposed to the wind or blowing. The Greek word used for wickedness is poneria. According to Thayer, this word means depravity, iniquity, malice, evil purposes, and desire. What the Apostle Paul is describing is the iniquity force itself. This force is is what allows these principalities, powers, and rulers to establish their thrones. The more they're able to increase the iniquity force within humanity, the stronger their places of power become. This wrestling in the warfare of the believer is to call men to repentance, to submit to the complete lordship of Christ, and to begin walking in the kingdom. For this great warfare, we have been given the very armor of God to empower us during the extended conflict. Look at that jump in. The armor of God. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I've heard many ministers approach Ephesians 6.13 as do all you can and then stand. In fact, prior to my research, I've been guilty of saying the same thing. However, Adam Clark provides a different perspective. And having done all to stand, rather, having conquered all, stand. This is a military phrase that's repeatedly used in the sense by the best Greek writers. Having in short times discomforted all our enemies, we returned with numerous captives and much spoils. See many examples in Kaipiki. By evil day, we may understand any time of trouble, affliction, and sore temptation. What a powerful statement. We are strong in Yahuwah and the power of his might. As we move forth in the armor of Elohim, we not only gain ground, but possess the spoils of war. Those spoils are the souls saved from the kingdom of darkness. This understanding of what Paul was saying in verse 13 adds so much more meaning to verse 19. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul was asking those in Ephesus to keep him in prayer so that he'd be enabled to gain more spoils in this warfare for the souls of humanity. Now let's begin examining the armor itself. The belt of truth. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. I believe that there is a divine order in establishing the armor of God in your life. God will not allow his armor to be placed on individuals haphazardly. Everything within the kingdom of God starts with truth. It's only in places where God's truth has displaced the dark knowledge of the Nakash that his kingdom can be established. This is similar to our discussion about what the apostle meant when he wrote about the inspiration of the scriptures within his own mind. He was describing the Old Testament. Therefore, when establishing truth in our lives, we must have the foundation of the Torah. If we remove the Old Testament from our consideration as God's unchangeable word, we have by default taking the entire New Testament out of context. Another interesting aspect of the belt used by the Roman soldier is that it held all his armor together. Without his belt firmly attached, he can risk, run the risk of his armor coming off during the conflict. This is a perfect illustration of how Christians can end up wounded on the spiritual battlefields of life. God's truth was not firmly established in the areas in which they were wounded. The Breastplate of Righteousness 
and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Paul was not referring to our own righteousness here. He's referring to the righteousness that is only found in Christ. However, we must remember that we had to remove the unrighteousness of our former life without Christ in order to clothe ourselves with the righteousness of our Lord. This is new righteousness it establishes great changes within our hearts. The law of God has been written on our hearts and the Holy Spirit has moved into our lives to empower the walk of righteousness. Paul is revealing to us that God now places his righteousness as a shield over the new heart we have in Christ. Today, we might even call it a bulletproof vest. This breastplate is to protect the enemy from inflicting damage to the vital organs of our spiritual walk. Shoes of peace, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Paul was not referring to nice dress shoes in this verse. The boots of the Roman soldier were some of the deadliest boots ever designed. These shoes had spikes on them that enabled the soldier to hold his ground during hand-to-hand -hand combat. If a Roman soldier had a half a chance, he would use those same boots to tear your kneecap off your body. We need to move past a hippie's definition of peace. The peace or shalom of the gospel is a full manifestation of God's salvation within our walk. It brings peace to those we minister to, as well as our own lives. However, it brings terror to the heart of the enemy. The gospel of peace allows us to take ground and hold ground from the enemy. The shield of faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Some view faith as a magical force that will allow us to gather in riches, or should I say, to become the Laodicean church. However, when we look at the biblical definition of faith, we get a completely different picture. First, faith is trust in God's steadfastness. If Almighty God takes us into battle, His grace is able to protect us there. Faith also has another meaning. To understand this meaning, we need to refer to another writing of the Apostle Paul. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it's written, the just shall live by faith. Romans 1.17 The words of the Apostle Paul are what inspired Martin Luther to trust into the completed work of Christ rather than the religious framework of Rome. But there's more to this story from the Apostle Paul. Paul was quoting the Old Testament, Habakkuk 2.4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. The Amplified Bible does an outstanding job of clarifying the truth conveyed in the book of Habakkuk. Look at the proud and his soul is not straight or right within him, but the rigidly just and the uncompromisingly righteous man shall live by his faith and in his faithfulness. This verse uses a form of Hebraic writing that contrasts two ends of the spectrum. You will see it throughout the Proverbs and other places within the Old Testament in the writings of the Apostle Paul, who was classically trained under the watchful eye of Gamaliel at the school of Hillel. The proud will fall because of the condition of his heart. A man who's walking with God is rigid and uncompromising in his steadfastness to his covenant with God. A righteous man will not compromise with the influence of the mystery of iniquity in the world. Now, let's bring this all together. A shield has two parts. The steadfast surface on the outside takes the brunt of any attack. This represents God's faithfulness in our lives. The inner side of the shield is designed to be handled by the soldier. It will have grips and straps that allow him to lay hold of the shield and not let go of it during the conflict. The, this represents the integrity of the soldier to not compromise with the enemy he is fighting. Without both sides of the shield operating properly, the shield can be rendered useless in battle. Then there's the maintenance of the shield that must be conducted by the soldier. Rick Bresner in Dressed to Kill, a biblical approach to spiritual warfare and armor, provides great insights into the required care of our shield of faith. How to care for your shield of faith. Because the Roman soldier's shield was made of leather, it was important for the soldier to take good care of it. No matter how hard and how long the enemy beats against your faith, your faith can outlast his attack. Although the six layers of animal hide made the shield extremely strong and durable, that tough, thick leather could become stiff and breakable over a period of time if it was not properly cared for. Therefore, it was necessary for Roman soldiers to know how to care for their shields, a soldier was given a daily schedule for maintaining his shield in excellent condition. 
each morning when he woke up, he would reach for his shield and a small vial of oil. After saturating a piece of cloth with this heavy ointment, he thoroughly rubbed the oil into the leather of the shield to keep it soft, supple, and pliable. For a soldier to ignore this daily application of oil and to let his shield go without this kind of required care was essentially the equivalent of inviting certain death. Because this protective shield was made of leather, it would have become hard, stiff, and brittle without the proper care. If not correctly maintained over time, the leather would have hardened until when put under pressure, it cracked and fell to pieces. This is why the end result of a soldier's failure to care for his shield was death on the battlefield. If the Roman soldier wanted to live a long life, it was imperative for him to pick up that vial and apply the oil to his shield every single day of his military life. Because the shield is representative of our faith, this analogy tells us that our faith requires frequent anointings of the Holy Spirit. Without a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit's power on your life, your faith will become hard, stiff, and brittle. If you ignore your faith and allow it to go undeveloped, never seeking a fresh anointing of God's Spirit to come upon your life, your faith won't be soft, supple, and pliable enough to stand up under your attack when a challenge comes your way. Faith that is ignored nearly always breaks and falls to pieces during a confrontation of the enemy. You want to hear about one of those such moments? Hold on. This reminds me of 2 Samuel 1, chapter 1. These are like serious levels of combat that if you don't carry shields, you're not going to get, right? I've never had to leather oil my shield. It's, it's just, we miss the context for these stories. And so this makes more sense when he's like to extinguish the fiery arrows of the enemy. Okay, hold on. First of all, I got to put to death a myth in your mind that you've been brainwashed because of Hollywood and they're wanding, they're just with the wizards of Hollywood. Fiery arrows, like you and I think about, were not bow and arrow fiery arrows. That That is almost never used in combat. Please understand this. In order to make an arrow actually hold something that stays burning over a long distance and then ignites a target is incredibly difficult to do. People that are called, I think, what are they, recreationist archaeologists, they have a technical term for it. People that, that read historical books or they discover stuff that they, un- they dig it up and they're like, okay, let's try to recreate the archaeology that we find here. Let's try to recreate this. There's some fantastic documentaries about this all over the place. You guys can check it out for yourself. But they tried to recreate fiery arrows, right? And the problem that you run into is basically in order to keep something burning as it leaves a bow, you're, you're going to shoot a fire through 200 miles an hour of air, right? It's hard to keep a flame burning. And so you have to put something on there. They have like a little basket sometimes on the end of it. But they would have to load that with really heavy stuff and compounds in there, which means the heavier that thing gets, the, the least the distance is that you can actually fire it off or you have to change the bow that it shoots from. A better translation is not fiery arrows. It is missiles, right? It's missiles like javelins, darts, literally big giant siege weapons. Somebody shooting a huge compound bow at you. That's a better description of it. He's not talking about little fiery darts coming at you like pew, pew. It's not reality. Almost never happened in battle. The only ways they're able to like recreate it successfully is basically through making an incendiary device, something that burns super hot at, at, for a long time in order to make it successful, right? Even today, we use something called tracers in the military. You can use a tracer eventually to set stuff on fire. However, we make incendiary rounds specifically custom catered to do that because it's not necessarily very effective. You're not certain it's going to work, right? We use compounds like magnesium and stuff like that and like... H-E-I, high explosive incendiaries and stuff like that. We have custom-made munitions for that, but something to consider, you guys. But extinguishing those fiery arrows, yes, if you're shot close range, like small, short distances, you can do it. But long distances, really not as movie fun looking as you imagine. They weren't just tens of thousands of fiery arrows raining out of the skies like the movies like to show you. It's not, not reality. This is chapter one. This is David lamenting after the death of Saul. Oh, there's this song. I'm going to jump. I think it's actually towards the end of this. I'm going to jump towards the end of it just so you guys grab it here. But it's so good. Young men are at David's side. Let's just read the whole chapter. It's more fun. Young men. Hey, you young men out there, you guys, I don't care if you're nine years old. You're a young man. You may not have a dad in your life to tell you that, but you're a young man now. Just stink and act like it. 
Put away the childish things. Get rid of the stupid Xbox. I'm telling you, it's murder for your soul. Put your phone away. You don't need it. You really don't. You don't need any of this stuff. You don't need the technology side of the, the mesmerizing devices of the devil. Let me tell you, please put it away now. Understand there's a lot of guys out here who are still just little children. They're stuck in men's bodies, but they're little boys inside because no man came along in their life and told them to put away the worthless, worthless childish-like things. If you're 9 years old, 10 years old, 11 years old, you're ready to start acting like a man and being treated like a man. People will respect you and give you responsibilities the more you act like you're capable of handling them. So listen, you have duties to go alongside people that are successful and competent and capable. Train yourself up. You do that. You study this up and you become wise in this book. Let me tell you, you develop the character traits that it says. This is what's righteous. This is what's wicked. People will respect you and value you tremendously. The most precious commodity in the world is a righteous man. That's the more valuable than anything else. They're the rarest thing to find today. Finding a righteous man of, of true conviction, biblical convictions, is becoming rarer and rarer, which means it's becoming more valuable, right? The more valuable it is, the more people will literally prioritize it and seek it out. Listen, so become somebody that's trustworthy. Just consider it, young men. You're going to hear about some young men, children. Remember this. In our society, these would be children that are at David's side. And it came to be after the death of Shaul, when David had returned from striking the Amalekites, that David remained two days in Ziglag. And it came to be on the third day that, see, a man came out of the camp from Shaul with his garments torn and dust on his head. And it came to be when he came to David that he fell to the ground and did obeisance. And David said to him, From where do you come? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. David said to him, What was the matter? Please inform me. And he said, The people have fled from battle, and also many of the people have fallen and are dead. And Shaul and Jonathan his son are dead too. And David said to the young man who informed him, How do you know that Shaul and Jonathan his son are dead? And the young man who informed him said, By chance I was on Mount Gilboa and saw Shaul leaning on his spear, and see the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called to me, and I answered, Here I am. And he said to me, Who are you? So I answered him, said, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me, Please stand over me and put me to death, for agony has seized me, but my life is still in me. So I stood beside him and put him to death, for I knew he would not live after he had fallen. And I took the diadem, it's the crown, after off of his head, and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them here to my master. And David took hold of his garments and tore them, and also all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Shaul, and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of Yahuwah, for the house of Yisrael, because they'd fallen by the sword. Then David asked the young man who had informed him, Where are you from? And he answered, I'm the son of a sojourner and an Amalekite. And David said to him, How was it you were not afraid to stretch out your hand to destroy the anointed of Yahuwah? And David called one of the young men and said to him, Draw near, fall on him. And he struck him so that he died. And David said to him, Your blood is on your own head, for your own mouth has witnessed against you, saying, I myself have put to death the anointed of Yahuwah. Do you see this? This young man is trustworthy enough to David to have him at his side. Understand, young men, that's the place you should be seeking to get to in your life, to where you can be at the side of men and women of, of wisdom. Men, you should be desiring to be there, to find other men that are righteous, that are above you, whether it's age, maturity, and wisdom, or intellect, or in a trade, or a skill, or in a position as an employer. You should be desiring to be at their side, right? This is what mentorship was all about. This is what tutorship used to be about. This is the gift that books can provide to you. If you can't go physically put yourself at the side of somebody who is walking in a righteous life, the gift of being able to read for yourself grants you the opportunity to step to the side of David and listen to his personal tutorship. His personal mentorship is available day and night. You can sit at the side of Solomon and listen to his, his literal most important pieces of wisdom he's ever given. You can go to the side of the Messiah and walk along with him to, to literally be in the dust of his sandals as he mentors you and counsels you and guides you and directs you. This is the intimacy of a relationship that you can have when you study these words. They can come alive to you. 
But if given an opportunity to put yourself in a position where you can be near a man of righteousness, somebody that's laboring for the kingdom, somebody that's laboring hard in their work, do it. Do it with all haste. Do it. Because you know what they want at their side? A trustworthy man. They want somebody they can trust their life upon that's upright and righteous. Man, I'll tell you, something that was the most desirable thing to me when I was running a, a ranch down in Texas, Central Texas, the thing I wanted and tried to find more than anything else was somebody to come alongside and help me, to co-labor with me. I was looking for young men because the truth is my body is blown out. I don't have the strength like I had when I was 16 and 17, 15 and 13. You know, I That's when the vitality of your back is physically most useful, and that's how you can make yourself useful. The sons who are homeschooled that I get to see some of the most incredible acts of strength and commitment to their families are the ones who are literally helping to serve alongside their fathers, work alongside their fathers. The greatest tragedy that happened in this nation was the eradication of child labor. Understand, we poisoned them with the artificial extension of adolescence and said, children can't work. They just can go be slaves to the state and to the government and go learn how to be stupid instead and be indoctrinated into the doctrines of demons instead. Right, The greatest tragedy is not allowing children to come and co-labor with us. We need them at our sides. They're far more capable, and they're more brilliant than we can even get our heads around. We just generally don't give them a chance because they're stuck and stupid watching TV shows and filling their minds with garbage all the time in school. Unfortunately, that's the way of the world. you know. But the ways of, of biblicity are not like that. You don't see that playing out in the scriptures. When you see young men and young women, we're talking young children for a reason, capable of great things when given responsibility, they can rise and shine with it. We've got to read, this is the power that we have to try to impart our wisdom on the next generation so they can break the cycle. And David lamented with this lamentation over Shaul and Jonathan, his son. And he ordered the bow to be taught to the children of Yehuda. See, it's written in the book of Jasher. Oh, there's another reference. Just saying. Love it. The splendor of Yisrael is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Declare it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exalt. Mountains of Gilboa, no dew or rain be upon you, nor fields of offerings, for the shield of the mighty lay rejected, the shield of Shaul, not anointed with oil. There you go. That was the reference I had. The oil of his shield was not there. His shield was not anointed with oil. Understand, they plundered his army. They took his shield away. This is truly fundamentals of how shields were taken care of. For with the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Shaul did not return empty. Shaul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Daughters of Yisrael, weep over Shaul, who wrapped you in scarlet with finery, who decked your robes with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wondrous, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of battle perish. It's a great chapter. David is a righteous man. He shows it, even with one of his enemies. You know what I'm saying? Guy who is actively seeking to murder David every single day of his life. He still laments over it. That's in the Proverbs, if you read uh, chapter 23, he's like, hey, hey, men, people, don't rejoice when your enemies lose. Don't rejoice on the day of their calamity. He's like, don't do it. That's one of those pearls that his son picked up from his father and his the way that he handled himself. It's like, listen, we shouldn't rejoice in their calamity. Let's Yahuwah see it and be like, mm, maybe I won't be so harsh against his enemies anymore. You know, we still lament in their day of their destruction. Let's go back. This is on page 321. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of Elohim. And I don't believe it was by accident that Paul gro grouped, excuse me. I don't believe it was by accident that Paul grouped the helmet of salvation with the sword of the spirit. Anyone trained in military knows that there is a mind body connection in relation to hand to hand combat. The soldier must be clear headed know who the enemy is, and possessed a focused intent 
during actual combat, both to survive and to gain a decisive victory in the conflict. The soldier's mind and body must both be trained in the art of warfare until his combat techniques are second nature. As the mind begins to think, the body is already responding in either attack, moves, or counter moves in response to the enemy. The reality of warfare illustrates the need for the believer to have his mind renewed by the word of Elohim. He must eat, sleep, and think continually as the soldier of the kingdom of Elohim. The commandments of Elohim, the authority of the name of Jesus, the power of the blood of Christ, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit must become embedded into a spiritual and mental operating system. Through the trials of life, he's proven the power of the weapons of his warfare in God's proving grounds and has absolute confidence in them. Let me bring this example given by the Apostle Paul into today's vernacular. As we renew our minds to the word of Elohim and train our bodies to discern between right and wrong, Hebrews 5.14, we develop a connection to the weapons of our warfare that are similar to the video game Halo. In Halo, the soldiers fitted with a powered assault armor, which is a technology-advanced combat exoskeleton. Don't laugh. DARP has claimed that such technology will be available within five years. A neural interface is connected to the soldier to his armor, which allows his armor to become an extension of his body. Believe it or not, there's a spiritual, psychological, physical connection to the armor and the weaponry of the believer. You cannot fake spirituality or fail to renew your mind to the word of God and expect your weapons to work properly. We were created in the image of Elohim. God's spirits, thoughts, words, and actions are one. When we renew our minds to the word, where our thoughts are in alignment with what God has produced in our spirits at the new birth, we begin walking in the kingdom in our physical bodies. In other words, our thoughts, intents, words, and actions become one. At that moment, we become part of the kingdom's special forces. There's no disconnection in our tripartite makeup. The power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit can flow unrestricted from our spirits through our souls into the physical world around us. We become wired to raise hell everywhere the soles of our feet tread. The renewing of the mind also stops the soldier from defecting. For those of you who have never served in the military, I'm speaking of a soldier who begins to identify with the enemy more than with the nation who sent him. The difficulty we have with the unrenewed portion of our souls is that it will resonate with the enemy, and the result is self-sabotage. If the renewal process has not been taken seriously by the soldier, the enemy can flip him into an asset. As Christians have discovered in nations where Christianity became illegal, the most dangerous asset to the enemy is someone who used to be a believer but has turned his back on the faith. This individual will know the habits, the meeting places, the leadership, and can speak the proper Christian terminology to be accepted by the group. Once infiltration has been successfully made, the group is taken apart from the inside out. This is literally why the Society of Jesus, like the Jesuits, this is why they are so effective at subterfuge and infiltration, because they are masquerading with the cloak of righteousness. They put on violence like a garment, right? And they infiltrate everywhere they go. They've been kicked out of over 80 countries in the world because they come in and they are the most parasitic force of destruction that's ever touched the earth. They are without in question the embodiment of the spiritual wickedness in high places coming in to eradicate it. One of the only people that excommunicated him on a huge scale, right? 1820, Alexander, the czar of, of Russia, had a brilliant move in eradicating and driving them out. And then just a couple years later, he also drove out every Freemasonic Lodge order member from that nation. He started purging the secret societies from within their midst because this is the double-mindedness that these double agents do. They masquerade as workers of righteousness, right? Building hospitals and taking care of children, the Shriners bowing down and kissing the rings of Lucifer. And on the other side, they are just ravaging wolves, devouring children and the innocence of people, predating upon people's thoughtfulness of biblicity. Meanwhile, with a Gnostic interpretation, truly bowing to the, to the hands of Lucifer. This is unfortunately the paganistic ideologies that have infected our nation, why we must purge these things from our midst, drive these people from our borders as quickly as possible. The true invasion force that people are not, not even talking about. They're like, they're coming over the border. I'm like, they've been here a long time, you guys. You need to kick them out of our borders. It's the enemies are within a lot more, a lot more concerning than some migrants coming across a wall. Trust me, you guys, you have no idea the level of evil that's in every one of your towns and cities that has infested this world. Horrific stuff. People have been doing it for a long time. 
Christians, we need to block the constant bombardment of our souls with the propaganda of the kingdom of darkness and replace it with the truth of God's kingdom. We cannot spend 10 minutes a day in the world and ever hope to counteract the influence of Mystery Babylon through our media outlets. It's time to disconnect from the continual feed empowered by the darkened immortals of hyperspace and move from entertainment to kingdom empowerment. It was in the city of Antioch where pagans began calling believers Christians because they were running around imitating Jesus. The word tells us how Jesus conducted his walk here on earth, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, Acts 10, 38. In other words, Jesus walked among men to raise hell. May all of us learn from his example and move in the power of the Holy Spirit to live just like he did. The Lance of Prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Until reading Rick Renner's book on spiritual warfare, I had never heard another minister teach that prayer is part of the arsenal of the Christian soldier. Our prayer life allows us to strike the enemy before he gets close enough for hand-to-hand combat. Rick shares about his powerful discovery. Paul finishes the discussion on spiritual armor in verse 18 when he says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. As I studied these verses about spiritual armor, I was perplexed when I came to the end of this text. I was particularly puzzled by what most commentators and expositors had to say at this point. Although all of them agreed that the Roman soldier had seven pieces of weaponry in his suit of armor, they all said Paul's list of armor was incomplete, stopping short of mentioning one more weapon, the Roman soldier's lance. I was perplexed by the absence of the lance because Paul commanded us, put on the whole armor of God. I thought, if it's true that the lance is not part of our armor as these commentators and expositors claim, then it is impossible for us to put on the whole armor of God because the lance was a strategic part of a Roman soldier's weaponry. When you wield the lance of prayer and supplication, this powerful prayer tool is thrust forward into the spirit realm against the malevolent works of the adversary. I concluded that although the lance is not specifically mentioned by name in these verses, it has to be in this text. Otherwise, we do not have the whole armor of God. Then I came to realize that the lance is included as part of this spiritual equipment. It's found in Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. I call this last one the weapon, the lance of prayer and supplication. This realization that prayer is a vital part of our weaponry makes Paul's instructions to believers in Thessalonica even more powerful. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 This is... I just absolutely love that part. Okay. That to me is the embodiment of insight that is critically needed. That prayer, that intercession, you guys, hitting your knees, falling on your faces, is the -the over-the-horizon attack that we can launch at the enemy. It's the way that we can contend with these adversaries and go on the offensive. That's opening our mouths and having the word on our lips, the sword of the spirit. When we pray, that's how we can fight from a distance. That's how we can send up and petition Yahuwah to get his immortals to work on our behalf, to wage a war in those spiritual realms, to fight against these thrones and these powers and these dominions that are constantly belaboring to ruin the lives of the people on this earth, to destroy us, to drag us away into snares of their devices. But you know what? By prayer and with intercession, we can see a great change and a great deliverance brought to the lives of many. I pray that Yahuwah strengthens you guys in every area of your life that is weak and hurting and wounded. And I pray that he would bring healing and restoration to you in accordance with his will, that he would wash you with the water of the word so you can be transformed and empowered to know his will, to walk in it, to be bold and courageous, to overcome all the wiles and the schemes of the enemy, and that you would be clothed with power from on high to move in wonders on this earth. I love you all so much. Thank you for your continued support for my family. Thank you so much for the prayers, the encouragement you guys do, and for all of your willingness to seek to become new men and new women of righteousness. I love you guys so much. I'll talk to you soon.